Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Good morning, we will be continuing our discussion on traditions in world cinema and today's topic is Italian neorealism. So, we have been, uh, we know that there are uh, other traditions in world cinema such as uh, the French new wave, we have been talking about the German expressionism and the British new wave, several others. Uh, during the course of uh, this uh, discussion will also sometime later talk about um, the Iranian new wave cinema, the Latin American cinema. So, we are now, the attempt is here now to look at the major cinematic movements. So, um, we talk about Italian neorealism today, but before I talk neorealism, we should be able to understand what is realism after all. So, what is realism? Um, now, see realism again like other, uh, um, we are using the cinematic terminology here, cinematic vocabulary here, but it all goes back to literary terminology. So, realism finds its roots in the writings of French writers such as Honore de Belzor, uh, Gustave Flaubert, the guy who wrote Madame Bovary and Emile Zola who was also associated with the great naturalistic tradition. Now, historically we are at the point where artists reacted against the romantic movement of the late 18th and early 19th century. I am giving uh, you the a brief historical background. So, there was something called rom the romantic mo movement and realism was a sort of um, response to that. Now, um, realism after all uh, depicts uh, the everyday life, uh, particularly uh, the everyday life of the middle and the lower class uh, as they exist day to day. Uh, as opposed to the exotic, the romantic, uh, the ideal um, as was depicted during the romantic period. So, every day becomes worthy of high art. Now, um, it also led to uh, a certain degree of interest in the documentation of real life. So, uh, realism focused on depiction of characters and places and also situations as they actually appear in life. Not perfect, not completely flawed, but a natural combination of the two. Now, see prior to realism, the norm was to make characters less like real people and more like symbolic characters, the hero, the villain, you know the damsel in distress, all these archetypes. In cinema, realism is a stylistic choice and can be understood as an illusion that what is shown on screen is actually connected to reality. Now, realism is a contested term, what is real? People say Satyajit Rai's cinema, Satyajit Ray's cinema is highly realistic. Um, people may also question that, that how realistic is that kind of cinema. So, realist, uh, realism is a contested and a much debated term uh, that is um, are all things which we can recognize are they real, are all recognizable things real. It is uh, a mix of devices to disguise the fact that uh, the fact what we really see in real life. Now, uh, with the development of photography uh, and camera uh, was able to capture an objective truth about the world. Realistic films uh, present what appears on the screen as natural. Now, one of the very first film of this period was uh, one of the very first film actually. I am sorry to use the term one of the very first film, but the first film ever was something called um, arrival of a train at railway station at the station and also 
workers leaving the Lumiere factory in 1895 by uh, the French film pioneers, the Lumiere brothers and it was so real, okay, as close to reality as life. So, I would highly recommend that all of you watch these two films, the arrival of the train at the station and also workers leaving the Lumiere factory, the very first films ever made in 1895 by Lumiere brothers. Now, it may be noted that in a realist film, hero is not always easy to identify with and often carries a certain degree of moral ambiguity about him. In other words, to make a protagonist appear as a real person, a realist film must attribute those characteristics on the character which the audience perceive as real. Now, where is all this leading to, to towards Italian neorealism? Because what is neo? It must be a revival of interest in realism. So, cinema began um, perhaps you know uh, showing certain degree of commitment towards depicting reality. But somewhere along the life, uh, along the way, um, fiction overpowered. Okay, uh, something you know, a, a taste for adventure and romanticism, it took over. So uh, Italian neorealism was a response to that. So we need to connect realism with Italian neorealism. Now major theorists of realism are Rudolf Arnheim. Um, Siege Freud, Krakor and André Bezon. Now, Bezon in his What is Cinema says, photography does not create eternity as art does. It embalms time, rescuing it simply from its proper corruption. Uh, here, he implies that photography has a historical purpose in capturing a view of the world forever. This kind of filmmaking is associated with the kinds of films that were made in France in the 30s, particularly by directors such as Jean Renoir. And uh, uh, while talking about Renoir, we, I would suggest that you watch his film uh, called The Rules of the Game. Okay? So, this is uh, one film, uh, you know due to copyright acts, we may not be able to show you actual clippings from films, but um, what I would suggest is that you keep watching these films and um, I would be uh, uh, discussing these films and referring to these films, particularly certain scenes from these films quite often. So, uh, these films with uh, 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 their focus on stories about the masses and kinds of hardships common people faced, um, they were all about that. Renoir's use of uh, the long take also helped in his brand of cinema, which resulted in helping the audience to navigate their way around the frame rather than getting manipulated by editing techniques. Now, very close, I am uh, making a jump now from uh, the early kind of realistic cinema and something more recent, something more. So, 1895 we had one revolution called the invention of cinema and the first ever film and then in 100 years from then we were in 1995, where people like Lars von Trier um, established something called the dogma movement. The so, dogma movement, um, dogma 95 as it is called, it was established in 95 in Denmark by Lars von Trier um, and uh, Thomas Winterberg. Uh, it sets out the aims in a manifesto, uh, which referred, which is referred to as a vow of chastity. Dogme focused on form and not on form and content. The idea is to tell stories in bare and basic form and expose the artificial nature of filmic storytelling. With respect to content, most dogme films deal with the bleaker aspects of life. Some of the dogme principles are shooting on location and using no props. Uh, sound must not be produced, it should be uh, as true to life as possible. Camera must be handheld, handheld sorry, and uh, you may recall that uh, these are the features of the French new wave also. Um, they also uh, talked about using or uh, shooting films in color with no special lights and also not you avoid using 
optical work and filters, they shunned melodrama and also shunned special temporal alienation. The idea is that film should be about here and now. Genres are unacceptable to the dogmas, dogma, to the principles of dogma, and format should be 35 mm. And most interestingly, the director must not be credited. You can relate this to the theory of authorism. Now, there is another concept called cinema verite, which is literally truthful cinema. Cinema verite films are usually shot with light, easily portable, inexpensive equipment, handheld cameras on actual locations with real people and not professional actors and on a relatively small budget. The films are usually shot without a script and assembled later in editing. So, these are the, these are the principles. This is how cinema verite is generally understood and there is a film called Cinema Verite 2011, I would suggest that you please watch it. While talking about realism, there is also a concept of social realism, especially Soviet social realism, which is at the center of so, uh, social realist cinema and is fully recognizes the ideological potential of cinema. Uh, for example, the works of Russian filmmaker Sergei Einstein. Uh, and these works are the most important films in this category. However, this kind of cinema with a strong ideological overtones has been embraced in other countries also. For example, um, uh, uh, our own brand of uh, social realist cinema, um, uh, for example, I would say, you know, Said Mirza's uh, Albert Pinto Ko Gusta Kyu Aata Hai, it was a 1981 film starring as uh, Nasiruddin Shah and uh, Shabana Azmi. So, it comes quite close to social realism and several other films um, of uh, the so called parallel cinema movement in India. Um, there is another film called uh, Manthan, a Sham Benegal movie, okay, that also I would recommend if you are not already familiar with that you please watch it as an exemplar of social realistic cinema. <clears throat> we have another brand of uh, realism, kitchen sink realism, which is a part of British new wave cinema. It is particularly related to the literary movement of the 50s in Britain, uh, an important characteristic. Characteristic is uh, plots based on um, youth, the young people using their dialect, their attitudes, their angst, their anxieties. The idea was to explore social and political issues through a new kind of cinema and some of the great films of these uh, of this period most of them are based on uh, works of literature theater and novels so look back in anger saturday night and sunday morning a taste of honey etc now um, from here we move on to so, uh, uh, our discussion of italian neo realism so a brief background of italian cinema in uh, 1905, the first Italian studios were established. They were owned by two of the largest production companies, Cines and Italia, both of which made successful period films, costume dramas, some of which were The Last Day of Pompeii, The Fall of Troy and Cabiria. Now, Cabiria is a story of a slave girl, uh, which took six months to shoot the film. Uh, shoot uh, um, in the studios and also par partly and partially on location. It contains technical innovations such as dolly and crane shots and its success in America inspired uh, people such as D. W. Griffith and Cecil DeMille to launch big budget productions. The first world war and competition from the US film industry put an end to the large scale Italian productions. Ironically, it was the fascist regime under uh, Mussolini that revived Italian cinema. Mussolini, unlike Hitler or Stalin, did not aim uh, at total control over the content or style of the Italian commercial cinema. For propaganda reasons, Mussolini preferred documentary films and newsreels uh, 
produced by uh, an agency called LUCE. The fascist regime viewed Hollywood as its model and saw cinema more as a vehicle of entertainment rather than propaganda. So, you can compare this with Hitler and uh, uh, the entire propagandist machinery that he was associated with. You know, um, uh, there was a film called The Triumph of Will, which was made in order to project uh, Hitler in a very positive light, but uh, Mussolini more or less refrained from this. So, uh, it, he was more interested in cinema as um, uh, a form of entertainment, an artistic form rather than propagandist form. In the 30s, Italian cinema was dominated by the so called white telephone films and these films are about uh, the upper class, the aristocrats, the wealthy people of society. Um, uh, in 1935, the fascist regime founded a major film school, the Centro um, uh, Experimental di Cinematografia. In 1937, Mussolini inaugurated a film complex, Cinecita, and then a journal called Cinema was launched during this period. In 1942, Alessandro Blasetti made four steps in the cloud, which is a film that anticipated neorealism by using humble characters and ordinary background. Um, and then there was uh, the siege of Alcazar by Augusto Janina, which celebrates the defense of the fortress in uh, the Tofado region during the Spanish Civil War by Franco's, General Franco's fascists. It is in the style of a fictional documentary. The fictional documentary style generally meant adding a love story to adventure or war stories and this kind of hybrid plot became a typical part of post war neorealist cinema. The most significant documentaries shot from the Italian armed forces were Men on the Bottom by Francesco di Robertis and many fictional documentaries by the great Roberto Rossellini. Now, um, one of the key names of this period is Leo Longenesi. Now, Leo Longenesi was a journalist and a staunch a sup a journalist and a staunch supporter of Mussolini. He gave the motto, Mussolini is always right and he advocated extremely simple realistic films without elaborate sets. With the fall of Mussolini and the end of the war, international audiences were suddenly introduced to Italian films, especially uh, the works of Rosalini. Uh, the Sita and Visconti. Italian directors by this period combined the desire for cinematic realism with social, political or economic themes that would not have worked under the fascist regime. Now, neorealism cinema generally refers to the films of working class people uh, and it often depicts their abysmal poverty. Um, the peak period was the 40s and the 50s. This movement tapped into a particular transition in Italian life and became a vehicle for filmmakers interested in vivid description of history and society. The underlying message is that in a just society, their uh, wealth and means of wealth would be more evenly distributed. Often these films would be based on true incidents and often they often use newsreel footage. They were shot on actual locations and used non-professional actors. The plot and the characters were used as a vehicle for ideas and there was an emphasis on source sounds and avoidance of heavy musical scores. In the late 1940s, uh, neorealism's influence spread to Hollywood. Um, people started using actual locations and city was used as an important character and long takes were used to bring about a touch of reality. Uh, again think of um, our own Satyajit Ray and his brand of cinema uh, and also directors in Germany, Spain and Eastern Europe too were influenced by the Italian neorealist movement.
The first Italian neorealist film was Obsessio, directed by Lucino Visconti. Uh, it was based on American pulp writer James M. Kent's The Postman Always Rings Twice. Again, uh, some major Italian neorealists were Roberto Rossellini. He was named the father of mod modern film by Cairo du Cinema, the influential French film journal. Along with Jean Renoir, he was the most influential name among the Nouvelle Vague filmmakers. The Nouvelle Vague filmmakers from France, they um, held him in high regards. Rosalini's first three films are The White Ship, A Pilot Returns and The Man with the Cross. However, it was with Open City Rome uh, that uh, he broke into this uh, movement called Italian neorealism, neorealism and came to be associated with this movement. The film weaves together a variety of stories of Romans during the occupation of Italy by the German forces. It is shot on locations with non-professional actors using long white takes. Rosalini's next film, Paisa, contains six vignettes from the liberation of Italy, a chronicle of 1943 to 1946 and it was followed by Germany year zero which is a devastating tale of defeat and solitude and in one of the series, uh, in one of the scenes a recording of a Hitler speech echoes over the uh, devastated landscape. Together these films provide us with great commentary on the then contemporary social issues at a time of political movements of global importance. Rosalini fam famously said, I am not a pessimist. To perceive evil where it exists is, in my opinion, a form of optimism. After a spate of neorealist films, he made several films with Ingrid Bergman, the Hollywood actress whom he uh, later married, and also made several documentaries on and about Italy during this phase. Another important filmmaker of this period is um, Vittorio da Sita, who grew up in a lower middle class district of Naples and joined the stage. He began his career as a leading man, he, as a leading man in light-hearted romantic films, but soon took to direction. And um, his shoe shine, is scripted by the neorealist uh, theorist Cesare Zavattini, um, is an account of the shoe shine boys of the post-war Italy and the abject poverty these children lived in. His Bis the Bicycle Thief is commonly regarded as the film that heralded Italian neorealism in a real big way, in a major way. Uh, I would recommend that you watch a Bicycle Thief and perhaps you would discuss that as part of our course on film appreciation, which is the film is a characteristic of the Italian neorealism with its use of non-professional actors and shooting on actual Roman locations. Its influence can be felt on Satyajit Ray's Pather Panchali and films as recent as Children of Heaven um, 1999 from Iran. Other Italian masters include Federico Fellini, um, whose early work reflects a preoccupation with human weakness and also uh, an interest in illusion and loneliness. In La Estrada, which is a 1954 film uh, and it won him international recognition, Fellini unfolds a tale of traveling circus, a recurring motif, a recurring milieu in his works. The Dolce Vita is an eloquent dis, uh, statement on life uh, and its excesses and the role of so called paparazzi in the modern times. Um, this is a film uh, where uh, uh, the exploit center on uh, the plot centers on the exploits of a gossip journalist and this is the th this is one of the key film this is one of the first times that the term paparazzi was used Fellini's next major film was Eight and Half which is a semi autobiographical account of an artist's creative process the film traces a film director uh, 
you know, uh, partially based on uh, Fellini himself. And uh, the plot is that with a new project set to start and no script, the filmmaker has come to a dead end and the director, the fictional director plums the memories of his childhood and his hidden desires for inspiration. One of the famous lines go as, I have nothing to say, but I want to say it. Most of Fellini's films are autobiographical, quite personal in nature. They are influenced by his life, his dreams and also his love for performative arts. Uh, and then we move on to another influential filmmaker, Michelangelo Antonini. Antonini began his professional life as a critic and was fired by Mussolini's regime for his leftist views. Before turning into an independent director, he contributed to the screenplay of Rosalini's um, A Pilot Returns. His early films such as Chronicle of a Love Affair, um, which is influenced by Visconti's Obsession and the, uh, the Cry showed the influence of neorealism and established his aesthetics of alienation. His other major films include La Ventura, Blow Up, La Clise and Zabriskie Point. Blow Up uh, is uh, particularly important which is uh, Antonini's view of, world of, of the world of modern fashion and it is also a provocative murder mystery that examines the existential nature of reality interpreted through photography. Interestingly, it was set in the mid 1960s, mid 1960s London and uh, which is a locale which was fairly unfamiliar to the director. Um, the, uh, an, in, uh, an important thing about Blow Up is how it influenced um, the Hollywood filmmakers and uh, one of the key films that uh, um, inspired filmmakers of that period to experiment more with cinema. And um, so, moving on with Italian neorealist directors, another major name is Pier Paolo Pasolini, who is widely respected as a poet, novelist and director. He is one of the most controversial and ambitious filmmakers. His writings were scandalous and iconoclastic um, and uh, he celebrates the low lives of the Italian society such as hustlers, pimps, thieves, etc. His uh, one major film, he has made a handful of great films, but a major film is The, Go um, the Gospel According to Matthew, which was film, film in the district of uh, Basilicata and its capital Matera. It was shot in a neorealistic style without a screenplay and Pasolini's interpretation of Christ uh, was uh, uh, done by a non-professional Spanish student and Mary at the time of crucifixion is uh, Pasolini's own mother and the director uses minimal <coughs> sets and simple cameras to capture the story. His depiction of Jesus is more along the lines of a messiah of the countercultural times and an angry young man. Much of the dialogues in the film are in a debating style where a question is answered with a question of a or a parable. So, Italian cinema, the other great names are uh, Bernardo Bertolucci, okay, the director of Last Tango in Paris, The Last Emperor, Little Buddha and so on. And recent in Italian film cinema continues to enthrall the audience all over. For example, Il Postino, uh, Life is Beautiful and Cinema Paradiso. So, um, we continue with our lectures on traditional world traditions in world cinema in our next classes. Thank you very much. <laughs>